uh, and I thank the member for uh, the, the, uh, the chair for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, I call the honourable Amy Adams. Mr Chairman, I am very pleased to take another call in this part one debate because there are a number of matters, sir, that we still uh, haven't had a chance to address. Uh, and I want to talk to some of those uh, this morning in this, uh, in this call. And, and to begin with, I want to put a question to the Minister uh, and the Chair that I raised during the second reading debate. Uh, and of course, this is our opportunity to now ask the member uh, to address that. And I raised in that contribution, sir, uh, the uh, incongruity and the, the seemingly unexplicable reason for the, the matter that my colleague, Mr Falloon, has just been talking about, which is where the best start abatement rates have been set in this legislation. And Mr Falloon has just talked uh, very wisely about some changes he's proposing. But the question I have for the Minister that I th think he needs to take a call and explain is why we have these odd thresholds set uh, of a $79,000 uh, threshold for the abatement to start on the best start payment for years uh, two and three, but also this very, very odd abatement rate of 20.8%. And look, the, uh, the use of abatement rates and thresholds uh, are obviously a, a well-known and well-used tool, but these seem to be very, very inexplicable uh, levels to have set them at. Uh, and I raise the question in that second reading debate because actually uh, bringing in complexity to the tax system is something that we've always tried very hard to stay away from. And when you introduce a very odd, unusual and unprecedented level, there has to be a reason for it, surely, otherwise you wouldn't do it. And when I made the comment in the second reading debate, uh, the minister nodded and said, yes, there was very important reasons for it. And so I think now is the appropriate time uh, for the minister. And he's, he's nodding again now. So we will look forward to hearing from him a detailed explanation of why it is a 20.8% percent abatement rate uh, as opposed to a more uh, a predictable and expected rate and also uh, for the minister to talk to us about why the baby bonus uh, starts to abate at 79,000 where the other abatement rates in this legislation uh, are far more usually around the, the high 30s low $40,000. So I'll be interested to know why uh, this baby bonus that is universal in year one when it does start to abate abates in such a strange and unexpected way, and I look forward to the Minister explaining that to this House. Uh, Mr uh, Chair, I want to talk about a, an important aspect of the changes in this legislation and how they change the law that's currently on the books, uh, and that is around the timing of them. Because you have now a period, or we will have, uh, if this bill passes, a period uh, where the tax cuts that are legislated, that the National Government put in place in the 2017 budget will be abolished. So from 1 April, uh, taxpayers will now not get the extra $1,060 a week uh, in their pockets that they would have got. And yet the changes in this legislation don't take effect until the 1st of July. So I'm interested to hear from the Minister again why it is that for those three months, uh, the Labor government is quite contented to see people going backwards. Uh, and if they were so keen to replace our tax changes with a different package of assistance, and they were uh, true to their word that this was simply replacing uh, one form of benefit with another, why don't they start on the same date? Why is the Labor government leaving every taxpayer of New Zealand substantially worse off for those months of April, May and June of next year? Uh, so, Mr Chairman, I think those are important issues that really do speak to very real-world effect of this legislation on the people of New Zealand uh, that the Minister does need to explain to this House, uh, and I will look forward to him taking those calls. Mr Chairman, uh, I started talking about some of the abatement rate changes, uh, and that is something I want to come back to, because there are some, again, very incongruous uh, approaches in this legislation that make uh, a significant difference. And one of our jobs in this committee stage is to really explore those so that the, uh, the beneficiaries of any of these entitlements understand why they start losing money when they do. And, Mr Chairman, there are a number of uh, supplementary order papers on the table in my name that speak to this very point. Uh, and I want to take a little bit of time to address uh, the rationale for those changes uh, and to talk to the House about why I believe that those changes are sensible. So, uh, Mr Chairman, the, the SOPs in my name around the abatement rate changes really uh, relate to the family tax credit. Other members in the House have, have discussed and are proposing changes to other abatement thresholds. But the abatement thresholds and rates and timing for the family tax credit 
uh, is what I've focused some of my attention on uh, in this set of SOPs. And they are ensuring, sir, that we have, first of all, uh, a much more smoothed effect. Because actually, as a parent, you know that, Mr Chair, Mr Chair, um, the Mr. Honourable Chair, Amy Adams. Mr Chair, uh, as a parent, you know that there are costs that go with, with parenting, and the way the family tax credit system works is that there is one rate paid uh, for, the, for the eldest child, and then there is a lower rate paid for each additional child. Now, the changes that National had put in place and had legislated for said, look, we're not going to uh, penalise families if their eldest child is a certain age and then give them more when they're older. Actually, the National uh, Party, when it was in government, was of the view that that eldest child rate should apply irrespective of the age of the eldest child. I don't see any good reason why the eldest child rate uh, would apply at a higher level for children over 16 uh, and not for children under 16 for the eldest child. I can tell you, and many, um, um, I can tell members of this House, Mr Chair, and many members of this House will know themselves, uh, that many of the costs of having children uh, are actually particularly noticeable in the first 16 years of their life. Uh, as the children get past 16, in fact, often they're out working and, and providing some income for themselves and funding some of their costs. And actually, as a parent, it's quite a good thing to be encouraging them to, to be contributing uh, in some way, however small. So our view, Mr Chair, uh, and the one that my SOPs reflects, is that when you have this eldest child rate, it shouldn't be discounted if the eldest child is under 16. Uh, and the National uh, Party and the National Government, uh, under our changes, had made sure that the eldest child would get the highest rate uh, going, irrespective of whether they were over and under 16. And I'd like to hear from the Minister why he thinks that that eldest child rate, a family should be penalised if their eldest child is younger. So actually that's making it harder for families of younger children. And we've heard a lot from members, well, we haven't heard a lot from members in this debate at all from the other side, but, uh, you know, in, in the first and second reading debates when they had to take calls, they were keen to tell us how this was all about supporting younger children. And yet in this family tax credit space, the way that the Labor government has set up the abatement rates penalises those with younger children. Now, we think that's crazy. Our changes were very clear that the rates would be paid for the eldest child and then for subsequent children, irrespective of their age. But in the framing we have in this legislation, we've gone back to penalising younger children in a family uh, and only letting them get to those top levels when the children were older. Uh, and, Mr Chair, I don't see any good rationale for that. We've certainly heard none from the Minister and the Chair. And the SOPs that I've put up, and there are a number of them, I see the clerk uh, doesn't appear to have used a numbering system but a time system to refer to them, but members have them available. I have a number of SOPs uh, in my name that relate to the various aspects of the bill, uh, which are in Clause 55, inserting uh, changes to new clause MF4G4 and MF4F8 uh, and 4. And the, number, the, the reason for the number of different references is obviously because of the point I made earlier, which is that this bill differentiates between uh, people missing out for those first months before the 1 July changes kick in, and then the rates from there. So those are the points that I really uh, want the Minister to respond to. Why do we have these strange, odd, uh, complicated and seemingly incomprehensible abatement rate thresholds uh, and rates for the Best Start grant? Why has uh, the Labor government and the minister in this bill chosen to give less money to younger children and more money to older children uh, in the family tax credits? And why, Mr Chair, and this is an important one, why has the government, if this is about retargeting uh, the national government's tax cuts, why have they chosen to have families missing out entirely for that three-month period between the 1st of April, when our changes would have kicked in, uh, and the 1st of July, when these changes kick in. It doesn't seem to fit with the narrative. If the narrative is actually replacing one for the other, why don't they start on the 1st of April? If the narrative is actually about helping children with young families when we know the costs are the greatest, the pressures are the highest, and incomes are often lower, why are you, why are, is the government penalising those families by removing access to the higher rate of family tax credit and only providing eligibility for that uh, when the children are older and the families almost always are actually in a better financial position uh, as the years have passed. So those uh, changes, sir, seem completely at odds with the Labor narrative, as does the very fact of replacing uh, much of our universal tax cuts 
that they say are too universal with equally universal benefits. So I do implore the Minister to explain to us how his narrative makes sense and why he has left every tax-paying New Zealander worse off over the period from April, May and June of this year. Um, I call uh, Simon O'Connor.